Welcome to the Simsbury Land Trust presentation, Morticulture, the Abundant Life in Old Dead Trees. We manage many acres of forest and land and have become interested in how best to steward our preserves. My name is Marjorie Winters and I'll be your host. This is part one of our two-part Morticulture series. When we walk in the woods, we love to look at the trees. We know the trees are very valuable. There are many things that they produce. We rely on them for oxygen and prevention of soil erosion. We also know that harvested trees provide a lot of services for us, a lot of products. But when we walk in the woods and we see the trees that have died, you know, this tends to be a little bit of a concern. One is not a problem, but when we start seeing many, then we start getting concerned what is happening in the forest. But today we're going to discuss which tree has more value, the one that is living or the one that is dead. And actually, which one has more value to the forest? I teach classes at the Nature Center, Roaringbrook Nature Center, and we often teach about life cycles. And I've noticed there's something always missing in our life cycles, especially if we're doing things about life cycles of trees. So this is the typical life cycle. The acorn turns into a little sprout, it becomes a sapling and then it becomes a mature tree, which then produces acorns. We don't talk about what happens to the tree when it's fully mature. And oak trees can live for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then they start to senesce. Now that means that they start to, to die. They actually don't really die. They just sort of get broken or things, external factors can affect them um, and cause branches to break off, insects to attack and, and um, fungus to attack. Eventually the tree will turn into a snag, which is a standing dead tree, which will then topple over into a, a, a log. And here you can see a log that is under decay. And it is that decay process that's so important in the forest, it'll turn that tree back into soil, into that wonderful organic rich part of the soil, which is called humus. And that's where the acorns grow. That is what is needed to keep that life cycle going. So if we look at the complete life cycle of an oak tree, it's not just when the tree is mature, it's when the tree is what might be called over mature. And when it starts to decay, that becomes the, the fuel for the next generation of, of, of oak trees. So when we look from a forestry perspective, any tree that is past the sort of a, you know, it's starting to decay, that's over mature and it's really of no interest to the forester. But from an ecological perspective, that's where the value of the tree really comes into its own. So let's look back at what Connecticut looked like about 200 years ago when we were a heavily far, um, agricultural uh, state. Uh, we only had 20% forest. Occasionally the, fa the farmers would leave a tree in the field. And these were called the wolf or pasture trees. And these were the trees that the horses and cows and sheep took shelter on a hot summer's day in the shade of those trees. Those trees were left as the farms were abandoned in about 1880. A lot of farmers moved west to the lovely rich soils of the Midwest and the forest returned to Connecticut. And now we're about 60% forested and our trees are about 80 to 100 years, 140 years old. We have young mature forests. Every once in a while, if you go for a walk in the woods, you might see those old pasture trees. And these are the ones that are much bigger than all the rest of the trees. They tend to spread out more than the other trees and they're called wolf trees, not because of wolves, but just because they stood like a lone wolf at one point when they were in, in their younger stage. And there are certain stages that forests do go through. When the farms were a dominant land feature, we didn't have the forest. They started to return with young saplings and shrubs. The forest then evolved into a young forest with lots and lots of trees. Then as they became to mature, we got the older trees and some seedlings going and saplings growing underneath. But the interesting thing is the old growth phase of the forest, and that's where you get a, a variety of age stands and more openness in the forest than we have now. So one of the things I want you to do when you go into a forest is don't just look up at the trees. One of the most important parts of the forest is what's down on the ground. Look down. Oftentimes people will think that this is a messy um, collection of old logs, not always happy with the way it looks, but this is actually one of the most valuable parts of the forest. An ecologically fo a healthy forest has lots of dead trees with broken tops and limbs and downed logs. It used to be called coarse woody debris. Then people realized that debris did not sound good, so they now call it coarse woody material. And this is the most important part of the forest. So how we get that coarse woody material um, is dependent on how the tree dies. 
How a tree dies affects its ultimate role in the forest ecosystem. Sometimes they're killed by ice storms or winter storms when the branches break off. Sometimes you have beavers that have flooded an area and the trees have drowned. Sometimes you get animals that kill the trees, such as the sapsuckers drilling into the, the bark of the tree, introducing fungus into the tree, porcupines stripping the bark, the cambium layer, gypsy moss defoliating. And you can get a lot of trees dying in those situations. You can also get microbursts, um, such as that happen in the Adirondacks. And occasionally we get hurricanes. We get big hurricanes. Not frequently, but there was the great hurricane of 1938, on which two billion trees were knocked down, mainly on the western side of the state. And these tend to reset the forest back to its beginning, and it leaves a lot of things down on the ground. And often because that wood is very valuable, that wood is salvaged. Foresters also create some of these snags by cutting off the cambium layer, the outer bark layer of the trees. And that does produce snags, but we're gonna see that there are other ways of doing it that might be even more valuable to the wood, to the forest. So let's look at how a tree is built. We have the bark on the outside protecting the wood, and then you get the sapwood, that's the living part of the tree, and the heartwood is the center part that provides strength to the tree, but is no longer living. How a tree decays is affected by whether it was living or dead. A live tree, the decay can be in the heartwood, the sapwood tends to protect the tree. In a dead tree, the sapwood is what starts to rot first. So here's a picture of the sapwood rotting. Here's a log tree that was cut down, and you can see where the fungus is attacking the sapwood and leaving the heartwood alone. This is not going to become a hollow log. It will rot from the outside in. As opposed to the trees that have had branch damage, that's when the fungus gets in, the insects can get in and hollow out the tree. These are actually the more valuable trees in the, in the forest. And here's a diagram of how the fungus and the insects can get in past the protection of the bark and create those hollow trees. And fungus is, play, is we're starting to understand the importance and role of fungus in the wood decay system. It's really one of those things that you notice down in the logs, the wonderful variety of fungus that you can see. And there are two kinds of fungus, ones that help the trees communicate, but we're talking about the saprophytic funguses, the ones that help it decay. And you can't go through the woods here without seeing these fungus on the tree. There are two kinds of fungus too. There are ones that eat the lignin, they're called the brown rot fungus, and the ones that eat the cellulose, and that leaves the white rot. And when next time you're in the, in the woods, see if you can identify the brown ones. The brown rot adds to the soil organic matter. The one that the white rot actually holds water in the sponge and retains the soil moisture. And all of these things on the ground help return those that vital the vital nutrients of the tree back to the forest soil so that the next generation of trees can grow. So how long does it take for a log to rot? Well, if it's hanging up in the air like this one, it um, on a dry site, it can last for a long, long time. And a lot of times those trees act as little highways for the wildlife. You can see the footprints of some little creature who chose to walk along the log instead of along the forest floor. If it's in contact with the ground, it takes about 15 to 20 years to degrade. And if it's a stump, in the Midwest, it takes about 25 to 50 years for it to rot completely away. And this is what you might be left with. And you can see the various processes of some of the, the stump that's standing up. It's not in any decay at the moment, but the parts that have fallen on the ground have been ripped up by a variety of animals to look for insects. The fungus is eating it and it's starting to become part of the forest soil. And dead trees are so important to wildlife. Two thirds of all wildlife species use these dead trees for some portion of their life cycle. In the next section, we will talk about the wildlife species that use these old dead trees and their importance to the forest ecosystem. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions about the Sims Bay Land Trust, please feel free to contact us. In part two, we will learn how important these old trees are to our wildlife. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.